Amen. Good morning. morning. Welcome guests and uh, glad to have all of you with us this morning. Little light over here. Uh, Hope everybody's doing okay. Um, I want to thank all the folks who've been praying for me this week. Um, I need to stay away from people as much as I can a little bit longer, the doctor said. So uh, I got a mild case of the shingles, and from what I understand, uh, folks that have had a real bad case of the shingles uh, really struggle and are in a lot of pain. Um, Thankfully, they caught mine fast enough, and it's been contained to my lovely melon up here. Um, And uh, a lot of of discomfort and and pain at the beginning, but uh, I feel a lot better now. I've been on medication for a few days, and and it has uh, done its work. So thank you for praying for me, and... uh, uh, Looking forward to getting back to normal here in a couple of days, hopefully. Uh, Also, I wanted to let you know that if you attend my Sunday school class, normally it would meet in the fellowship hall. Today is going to be the first day that it will meet back here in room 202. And I want to thank Alan Martin, wherever he's sitting. I know I saw him come in. Uh, Alan's going to take over for me in Sunday school today. So I thank him for stepping up and handling it. There's Alan uh, for handling that for me today. appreciate that. Well, we are starting a new sermon series today from the book of Daniel. We will be looking specifically at three stories of faith. And last week, we, the last week, we will be examining Daniel's prayer from Daniel 9. And with this series, it is my hope that our faith will be built stronger and we will be encouraged to explore and exhibit our own faith more willingly, uh, even in the cases where it might cost us something which we might call persecution. You know, while our persecution might mean losing some popularity or getting ridiculed or made fun of or it might get us in trouble at work or might even cost us, at the worst case, probably a job, there are Christians around the world today who face real persecution. In the last year, 20 Christians in Libya were marched out and beheaded for their faith. In China, churches all over the country were forced to take and remove their crosses from their buildings. And many Christian leaders were jailed for being too overtly Christian in that country. A Japanese Christian journalist this past year was captured and put to death by ISIS through beheading. He was there trying to negotiate the release of another Japanese journalist who ISIS also put to death. These are the stories of faith that I would call furnace faith. The kind of faith that it takes to look into the eyes of evil, knowing death, or at the very least extreme persecution, lies in wait. To have the faith to face that death, knowing that even if God doesn't intervene, that he will deliver them to eternity. And that is where we're going to start this series today, at the source of where this idea of furnace faith comes from. But before we can get into the story for today, we need a little context. Now, context is the text around the text that helps us to understand what we are reading a little better. If you ever do any Bible study on your own, don't just read the text that you want to study, but also read the text around it. A little bit before and a little bit after. Sometimes just a few verses, sometimes whole chapters to understand what the chapter or section you're reading about is telling you. It sheds a little light on what you're studying and it helps you to interpret things a little more clearly. So I'm going to give you a brief understanding of the context by sharing some bullet point ideas from Daniel chapters 1 and 2 because we're going to be studying from Daniel chapter 3 this morning. Now, Daniel was very young when he was deported from Judah, where he was, to Babylon as a slave. And he remained faithful to God as he grew and true in his walk with him. Now, Daniel eventually becomes the advisor of King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel gained favor by interpreting a dream for Nebuchadnezzar. And from this point forward, I will refer to this king as Nezer. Now, I don't know if you've ever watched or been forced to watch any of the VeggieTales movies, But uh, my favorite one is the one about King Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel and the lion's den and and Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego and all that. It's a great, uh, one of the greatest veggie tales there is. And they call the king in that story, Nezer. And you're going to get that a little bit. So the rest of this this, uh, sermon, I'm going to call him Nezer. Uh, 
just because it's easier to say multiple times than Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Daniel decided to interpret Nezer's dream because the king was planning to put all of the wise men of Babylon to death. And Daniel and his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, were scheduled to be executed because they were wise men. Now, Nezer is amazed at Daniel's interpretation and spares Daniel, putting him in a high position in charge of all the wise men of Babylon, including his three Jewish friends, who Nezer gave new names to, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who from now on this morning we're going to refer to as Rack, Shack, and Benny, as they did in the VeggieTales movie. They were made administrators in Babylon. Now, Nezer's faith in God, the God of Israel, had not been secured, even though he was impressed with what Daniel had done in this interpretation. And in his ignorance, he builds a 90-foot statue of pure gold, indicating that since he thought he knew what was to come, he could somehow avoid it. And Babylon would be that kingdom that Daniel said would last forever. Now, we all know that that's not the kingdom Daniel was talking about when he interpreted the dream. The kingdom he was talking about was the kingdom that Jesus, the Messiah, was going to bring. So we make it to verse 4 of Daniel 3. This is where we're going to start this morning. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles in the pews there in front of you. And we encourage you uh, not only to use one of those today, but take one with you if you don't have a copy of God's Word. Daniel 3, verse 4 is where we're going to pick up our reading for today. Now, I'm not going to read the entire chapter 3 because there's a lot of text, but I'm going to uh, give you bits and pieces and then tell some of it in story form. Starting in verse 4, Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and people of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now, we see in this next part of the text that Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, Rakshak and Benny, they didn't bow down. They stood as that music played. And there were some Babylonian astrologers who were part of this group who were jealous of Daniel and Rakshak and Benny. And so they go to the king to try to get those guys in trouble. So we pick up again in verse 13. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, if the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Now, Rakshak and Benny's response infuriates Nezer. And so he orders these men to face the prescribed fate, to be thrown into the fiery furnace. Now this furnace wasn't a small wood stove or a furnace like we have in our homes today. It was an industrial furnace used to smelt metals or bake bricks. It was huge, 
The temperatures inside the furnace were so hot that a human could not survive even for a minute. In fact, the fire ranged so hot that when the men were thrown in, the soldiers who threw them in were killed by a blast of the flames and heat. This probably should have been a red flag for Nezer. His men perished. But the three who were thrown right into the furnace stood up and walked around. Let's pick up our reading starting in verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up into the fire? They replied, Certainly, your majesty. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out! Come here! So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble For no other god can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Now let's put ourselves in Rakshak and Benny's shoes for a moment. If we faced something like this, let's think of some of the excuses that they could have used to get out of this mess. They could have just faked worshiping the idol, to get out of it so they didn't get into trouble. Have you ever found yourself acting like someone you are not to avoid being made fun of for your faith? They could have made the excuse that they could have just worshipped at one time and then asked God for forgiveness. Have you ever justified your sin at some point in your life knowing that God's grace is upon you? They could have made the excuse excuse that, well, the the authorities are in charge, so we have to do what they say. We're told in Scripture to obey the authorities that are in power, even if we don't agree with them, right? God will understand. Have you ever said something like, well, I can't talk about my faith at work. I could get fired. God will understand. They could have felt like they owed Nezer something. After all, he did appoint them as leaders. They could have felt obligated to do what he said. Have you ever compromised your faith because you felt like you owed something to someone else? They could have made the excuse doing this once isn't as bad as what our ancestors did. They built altars and idols in the temple, the temple of God in Jerusalem. At least we didn't do that. Have you ever justified your sin by comparing it to someone else's sin that you deem to be worse than yours? They could have thought that, well, if we do this, it's really not hurting anybody else. Have you ever justified your sin by thinking it wasn't going to hurt anyone? They could have said, if we get executed for standing up for God we believe in, Who will watch after our family? Who will watch out for our people? Have you ever put your personal needs or the needs of family over the gospel? I know I've done that one and several others on this list. And which of these excuses have you used for not standing up for God? Rack, Shack, and Benny could have made excuses for falling at the feet of an idol. They could have made all kinds of excuses. They could have made any kind of excuse or justification that the mind could come up with. But they didn't. 
They could have done any of the things on that list, but they chose God over themselves. Rack, Shack, and Benny chose to stand up, even if it cost them everything. And God honors their unmatched faith by sending someone to deliver them, them, them from the flames. Many speculate that the fourth man in the furnace was an angel. Others speculate that it was a pre-incarnate Jesus based on Nezer's description that the fourth man looked like a son of the gods. I tend to lean toward that interpretation that this is one of the places that Jesus shows up pre-incarnate in the Old Testament and did so because God was so moved by the unmovable faith of these three men. Also, a foreshadowing or a type from the Old Testament that points us toward Jesus. Faith in Jesus delivers us from an eternity in a lake of fire. Food for thought there. But regardless of whether it was an angel or Jesus, God is glorified by their faith and they are delivered. So what does this mean for us today? For us, first of all, we have to stop making excuses. When God calls us to step up for him, we need to stop justifying and excusing our unwillingness to serve him. If God has called us to talk to a coworker about our faith and has given us the opportunity to do so, we can't make the excuses or justifications to not follow God's call on us. When God calls us to give sacrificially or to serve a neighbor or to reach out someone unlovely in our eyes. And we refuse to do so because of the cost. We're just making excuses. We have to stop that and start responding. Secondly, we have to stand up whether God intervenes on our behalf or not. God stepped up and delivered these three guys in our story today, but they were willing to submit to their unfair punishment for their faith, even if God chose not to save them. We have to stop putting conditions on God before we respond. Have you ever done that? Well, God, I'll go do what you've asked me to do, but only if blank, blank, blank. Well, God, if you will just step in and do this for me, then I will give my life to you and do whatever you tell me to do. Or God, if you will just save this person's life, I will give you everything I can. We always put conditions on God before we'll act in his behalf. If it is his will to deliver us from persecution, then praise be to him. We have to respond in faith when God calls us to action without requiring him to respond on our behalf. And if he, for whatever reason, withholds his deliverance, then praise be to him as well. Because there are eternal reasons for temporary trials. The things we go through on this earth, especially things like persecution, are jewels in our crown of glory in heaven. Paul often rejoiced in his letters to the churches for the persecution he would suffer for spreading the gospel. Many of the apostles rejoiced when they first persecution, even execution, for what they believed in and the gospel they presented. Because it meant that they were willing to give everything to follow Jesus something Jesus said would be rewarded in eternity. James, the brother of Jesus, one of the first leaders of the church in Jerusalem, wrote in the, uh, chapter one of his letter to the churches, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything if any of you lacks wisdom. You should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. 
That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. And later on, in verse 12 of chapter 1, he writes, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. See, folks, we need to be thankful that our destiny is in God's hands. That's the joyful news of it. Even if there's persecution in this life, even if we have to face trials of many kinds, our destiny is in God's hands. Even if we don't overcome the trial or the burden that comes in this life, we're going to overcome and be in eternity with Jesus. And for that, this morning... We should rejoice. Rakshak and Benny knew that their fate rested in God's hands. And no matter whether he saved them from the flames or whether he chose to let them perish in them, they knew they would be in God's hands. And that God would rescue them either in this life or in the next. And we need to take that same attitude when being called into action by God to know in our heart of hearts that no matter what comes our way because of our faith, service, and actions for the kingdom, God has us in his hands. Remember, we talked about the fact that Christ has promised to be with us always, even to the very end of the age. And even if we suffer trials in this life, we have the promise of a blessed eternity at Jesus' side. Which should give us all the inspiration we need to have faith in Him. Here's our main point this morning. And it's really just a challenge statement. Stop making excuses and start making Him famous. That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. They didn't make excuses. They didn't come up with reasons why they shouldn't do what God was calling them to do. To stand tall while everyone else fell at the feet of this 90-foot fake statue. This fake God. They could have done all those things, but they instead stood tall. And they made God famous. Remember what King Nebuchadnezzar said after they came out of the furnace. If anyone, <laughs> if anyone makes fun or degrades or says anything about this God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they'll be cut into pieces. And their homes will be turned to rubble. That statement from the king of the known world at that time it was a statement that made God famous. It made God's power and God's ability to save known. I encourage you to consider what steps you can take this week to begin building a furnace faith. Certainly it would be awesome if we were like uh, Rack, Shack, and Benny and all of a sudden we just all started standing up for our faith like soldiers for God, right? Wouldn't that be awesome if we just all started doing that? Reality and history has told us that it takes time to build that kind of faith. But what steps can you start taking to start building that furnace faith? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to listen to God. These aren't in your bulletin, but you can write these down in the margins if you want. First, we need to listen to God. We need to spend time listening We've talked about this before when we've taught on prayer that part of our time in prayer is supposed to be time spent listening for God to speak, listening for God to lead, listening for God to show us what he wants us to do. Secondly, we have to seek his will. We have to seek it. We have to look for it. What's your will, God? Show me. Show me where it's at. Look for it. Watch for it. Wait for those opportunities. Be anxiously anticipating opportunities. More often than not, we're like walking through life and all of a sudden an opportunity goes by and we're like, oh, that was one, and I missed it. Ah! We should be looking for those opportunities, seeking God's will, looking for opportunities to share the gospel. And then when he does show us his will, we need to respond when he calls. That's the third one, respond. Respond. 
Even if it's something small, even something as simple as being kind to someone or loving as someone who others might consider or deem unlovely. Or maybe it's taking time to share your life with someone else or whether it's taking time to talk about your faith with someone else. So we need to listen, we need to seek, we need to respond, and then the last one is we need to disciple. To be one and to make disciples. It's in our relationships with others, in discipleship, that we gain the courage to move when God calls. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego gave us that example. You know, these guys... They had faith in God for sure as individuals. But you better believe that their courage was stronger because they stood side by side. Because there was not just one of them, they had the courage to stand tall in the face of what was to come. Certainly, we need God. And God is all we need when it comes to delivering us from evil. But... We get courage to stand in front of that evil when we have our brothers and sisters on either side of us, right? Take those steps more and more every day. Baby steps if you have to. Take a little step at a time, but always be moving forward. Stop taking a couple of steps forward and then making an excuse and take five steps back. (laughs) Keep moving forward. Take those steps, and you too will build a furnace faith. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you today, and we thank you for this opening story from the book of Daniel, the story of these three faithful men who are willing to stand tall in the face of adversity, willing to stand tall for their faith, willing to stand tall even though it was going to cost them everything. All for the purpose of making you famous. Making you known. Giving you an opportunity to exhibit your power and your salvation. Father, let us look upon this story and the stories that we find in the Gospels and in the rest of the New Testament about men and women who stood up for what they believed in, even if it cost them everything, as a shining example to us. Let us always constantly keep in our prayers the people all over this world who are still today constantly putting their lives on the line for the sake of the cross, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of your son Jesus Christ. Father, lay your hands of protection upon them. Guide them, direct them. Build a fortress around them. Keep them. Embolden them. Strengthen them. And Father, let us quit worrying about the little things like being made fun of, of being judged, of being harassed, of maybe getting in trouble. Let us put those silly things to the side and stand tall for you. We pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen.